Welcome to the Design Materials channel. I am Edson Mafus, architect and professor of architectural design at the School of Architecture, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, Brazil. I'm back with another video on architectural design. Its specific theme is the analysis and comparison of two buildings based on a similar formal strategy that of parallel strips or parallel re rectangles. Its generic theme is again the conception of architecture as a, as a transformation and adaptation of knowledge. Resistance to the use of history as a reference for design has several origins. One is the belief that it hinders the architect's creativity. Another is the notion that using history would inevitably lead to literal copies, which is very often associated with lack of talent and even dishonesty. However, as the architect Santiago de Molina has said, quote, copying is an impossible act since the place, the material, the client or the constructive means of architecture are never identical and every copy ends up being modified by repetition, serialization or similar acts and it becomes a transformation or combination strategy. That is, any organization scheme available in the historical repertoire admits the creation of countless different projects based on it, its generality and abstraction being transcended the moment it acquires historicity. In other words, it, the moment it becomes influenced by its physical, social, cultural and economic context. A comparative analysis of two projects can help to make this clearer. They are the Kimbo Art Museum, built in Fort Worth, Texas, United States, by Louis Kahn, and the Classroom Building No. 3 at the University of Alicante, in Alicante, Spain, whose author was Javier Garcia Solera. Both employ a design strategy that arranges strips or rectangles in parallel to suit different programs. The choice of these two examples is due to the fact that they represent different interpretations of the same compositional strategy. The fact that there is no relation of influence from the first to the second helps to reinforce the notion that there are certain constants in architecture that are independent of time and place. The origin of this parallel block scheme is difficult to locate, and it may not even be important to do so, but it already appears in the teaching of of Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand in the beginning of the 19th century when referring to the combinations of five and seven base, which are longitudinal space strips. The Kimball Museum is located in a park in the city of Fort Worth, Texas and forms part of a cultural hub in which there are other museums, authored by well-known architects like the American Philip Johnson, author of the Eamon Carter Museum, and the Japanese Tadao Ando, author of the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Before entering into the analysis of the formal structure, it is important to comment on the relationship of the building with its surroundings. The Kimbo has its axis of symmetry aligned with the street that gives vehicular access to it, occupying a stretch of street that was removed to allow the construction of the museum. This anchoring of the building in the context was very opportune because it allowed to reverse an initial mistake by the architect. 
Khan clearly imagined that the access to the building would take place across the main axis, with visitors arriving from the side streets, passing through the two porticos aligned to the access and only then turning 90 degrees and reaching the main door recessed under the third portico, which faces west. However, Khan does not seem to have understood that in Texas most people travel in private cars, and since it is not possible to park on the side streets, there is only the museum's own parking lot on the east side, much closer to the lower entrance. Therefore, in practice, the main entrance to the museum today is the one on the ground floor, luckily well resolved and leading to the same point as the upper entrance. Here we see the side entrance as imagined by Khan, going up the ramp in the, the portico. And here the side where the main access happens today. The organization of the Kimbo Museum can be understood in an abstract way, as the arrangement of 16 rectangular spaces of approximately 30 by 6 meters, three of which are exterior porches on the west side with 1.8 meters service strips between them. The basic wing with six wide bays and five narrow ones multiplied by three The central wing is reduced to four big units and three narrower ones in order to create the conditions for access and hierarchy. The place where the, the grove of trees is located by the entrance, main access, symmetry axis, the one which, which is aligned with the street, the three external porticles which articulate the axis to the building, the imagined route into the building, A historical look will identify a regular and symmetrical arrangement of three blocks, the central block being shorter than the one in which the excesses and vertical circulations are located, the others being dedicated to exhibitions. The second interpretation is perfectly acceptable in the case of Khan, whose training took place in a school that followed the principles of French fine arts. The same historical look will not fail to relate the organization of this building, especially when viewed from the east, with the bass plus piano nobili so common in pre-modern pre architecture. You can clearly identify on, on this plan two kinds of spaces, the large vaulted spaces and the narrow and lower strips adjacent to them. The larger units and the narrower strips. It is in these smaller bands that are located the main stairs, deposits and niches that receive the panels that allow subdividing the space. In addition, most services run horizontally 
across the space between the slab and its lowered ceiling. According to Kahn, these smaller bands are, quote, an unplanned availability. A, a plan is only good when many things can happen without destroying it, unquote. A recurring aspect of Kahn's mature work is very evident here. The starting point, the initial organization scheme, is in most cases symmetrical and regular. With the adaptation to the program and the place, this initial rigidity was softened and the internal distribution of parts was modified accordingly. This is very clear in the main floor of the Kimball. To one side there is the auditorium, a freight elevator, a staircase and the largest of the courtyards, while to the other there are two smaller courtyards and two stairs that give access to the lower level. In programmatic terms, the museum's ground floor houses a lobby gallery, offices, art conservation laboratory, photographic studio, workshops, warehouses, and a loading dock for track access. This is how the main entrance happens. And this is one of the twin stairs that take one from the ground floor to the upper floor. On the top floor is the museum itself. Galleries, restaurants, shop, auditorium, courtyard, and library. This is the main lobby, where one gets from the stairs on the left or from the door on the right, meant to be the main entrance by Khan, but in fact a secondary entrance today. Same space, close to the entrance door. A similar space by the main courtyard, close to the restaurant. The auditorium with Khan in the picture. This, this, the small courtyard on the top floor and a very interesting space that almost no one knows is the library occupying the space within the vault, within one of the vaults and taking full advantage of natural light coming from the, the, the opening at the top of the vault. The circulation pattern reinforces what was said about the softening of symmetry and regularity. Although access from the outside is through doors located on the axis of symmetry of the tripartite organization, inside the building circulation is rarely determined by the system of parallel strips. This only happens when one uses the public stairs that join the two levels. The basic space unit at the Kimball is a 30 by 6 meters room covered by a cycloid vault and supported by four pillars, two at each end. The set of 16 juxtaposed rooms form a whole that meets not only Kahn's goals, which was achieving Roman grandeur through modern techniques, but also those of the museum which were to provide the new museum with flexibility, abundant natural light, harmonious simplicity, a welcoming feeling, intimacy, and a, quote, certain elegance, unquote.
Natural light appears as the protagonist of the space, not only in the vaults characterized by the linear openings at the highest point and their light diffusion system, but also through the courtyards that can inserted into the plan and that modify the space for the better. One of these courtyards starts at the ground floor, qualifying the most private workspaces. The Kimball Museum is a building that, despite its modern appearance, reveals itself to the informed observer as a proud descendant of the architecture of the centuries that preceded it. Imagine taking one of the side wings of the Kimball and performing a conceptual operation. The narrower strips become exterior spaces. One strip of each type is added to the group, and we have the Aulario tree scheme. Or rather, the, the classroom building number three of the University of Alicante. Without taking into account the precedent, the evolution of the project seems to involve four steps, not necessarily in the same order shown here. Basic unit multiplied by seven, the path that unifies everything, and the courtyard that creates a kind of center for the repetitive scheme. As already mentioned at the beginning, reading architectural strategies without considering their historicity is reducing the design process to a diagram without content. In Alicante, a number of constraints have had decisive influence on the final result of the project. The peripheral position of the site on campus, surrounded by parking lots, its initial destination for large deposits and the decisive fact that the foundation piles were already executed, forming a 5 by 10 meter grid with little bearing capacity. In addition, the project should be ready in 45 days and the building in 6 months. The building is located in a very interesting campus, a place which used to be in uh, a kind of small regional airport, and a number of small buildings from the airport were kept in the, in the design of the building. Here we have the, the classroom building, which is the object of the, the current analysis. Here we have the school, no, the, one of the buildings remaining from the airport. The School of Architecture, designed by Garcia Solera's wife, Dolores Alonso. And the rectory, or the rectorate building, designed by Alvaro Siza. The position and capacity of those foundations led to a serial organization composed of seven blocks of the same dimension in plan, 43.6 by 13.15 meters, and variable section, the internal height is always three meters. 
separated by linear courtyards that vary from 2.5 meters to 4.3 meters and joined by light metal bridges that allow continuous longitudinal circulation through the entire building. The two blocks to the north, closer to the center of the campus, are different from the others, housing smaller rooms, offices, a small cafeteria and a courtyard that solves the problem of lack of hierarchy in the whole serial organization, creating a space of centrality. In the other five pieces, there are always two larger classrooms and a toilet block next to the main circulation axis. Each of the seven blocks consists of a structure of concrete walls and slabs capable of supporting the existing foundations and having cantilevers in any direction. The smaller sides are completely opaque, another result of the hostile environment, the larger ones being open to the courtyards and protected by vertical aluminum sunshades. The finishes are compatible with the short deadlines and the limited budget. Even so, in constructive terms we are facing a very high quality work. The path that connects the seven rectangular units, here appearing in its original original uh, way, the way it was thought about by the architect, without any limitations, free to to be walked on or, or to be walked through 24 hours a day, and then after they had to to put doors to limit the action going on during the nights in the building. The courtyards may seem narrow, but they are enough to ventilate light and protect the classrooms from the sun. This is the wide corridor that gives access to the classrooms. External access. This is the, the closest access to the campus center. Thus, it is where most students arrive from. This is the access from the opposite side, from outside of the campus, as the building is situated at the at the border of the, of the campus with the city. The courtyard. One of the classrooms, the one just next to the courtyard. It is interesting to see how two projects that start from the same scheme result in buildings that are so different in almost all aspects. At Kimball, we see a symmetrical and axial general organization consisting of three blocks in which the parallel strips combine to form interior spaces of considerable length, distinguishing each other by the role they play. They either serve or are served. Despite regularity and axiality, the internal circulation is free and is not determined by the architecture. Whereas in the classroom building, the strips are by nature different. 
The wide ones cover the needs of the program. The narrow ones provide lighting and ventilation. The general organization is serial, and the internal circulation is much more defined. In an orthogonal system whose backbone is the path that crosses the building. This is the secondary circulation system, which is subsidiary from the, the main one. In conclusion, it does not seem sensible to practice a profession without using the knowledge accumulated over many centuries. Whoever uses this almost infinite repertoire avoids reinventing what already exists and has been tested many times as well as ensuring historical continuity that is essential for anyone. Innovation will be important whenever problems arise for which there is no precedent. Trying to innovate without the need for it is opening the door to arbitrariness. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked and I hope you come back for the next video.